The most expensive Senate race and perhaps most consequential in decades currently underway. L.A. sees a massive COVID spike. Dictator Cuomo wants to be able to imprison anyone. Antifa terrorizes Josh Hawley's family. And is Kamala plagiarizing stories from MLK? permanent and will be irreversible. Can't let it happen. Nothing and no one will be able to stop them. These Senate seats are truly the last line of defense. Now, I must preface that by saying because they'll say he just conceded. No, no, I don't concede. So we have quite an important race today determining control of the United States Senate. As you know, Republicans already have 50 seats. Democrats have 48 seats. There are two Senate seats in play because there was no one who got more than 50% in the election, so that forces a runoff. And now we have this battle between these candidates playing out with the whole country watching very closely because so much is at stake. You got Ossoff hoping to defeat Purdue. You have Warnock up against Kelly Leffler. And many people now sitting around wondering what would happen. I mean, the president even understands the stakes here. What would happen if the Democrats had, well, I shouldn't say uncontested, but majority control. Hopefully we'll contest it no matter what. Majority control in the House, the Senate, and, and of course having the presidency as well. What are the kinds of things that they would do? Often we talk about politics in more general terms. Perhaps even we focus in on things that are more theoretically impactful, that are more a question of what is, what is best, what is right, but not necessarily what will affect you. The control of the Senate, especially when you take into account the very high likelihood that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the 99.9% likelihood that they're going to be the president and vice president of the United States in just a matter of weeks here. The Senate is, as the president, as our current president Trump pointed out, the last line of defense. And if you have Harris and Biden, gosh, I didn't mean to say it in that order, but it seems right, doesn't it? Increasingly, this will look like a Harris presidency with this guy named Joe Biden who's hanging out in the Oval Office, but not really calling the shots. That's my prediction. But if they don't have the Senate, they're not able to do the same kind of long-term damage, and they're much less likely to be able to do damage that will affect you. Here's what they're not telling you. Here's what you're not hearing about what this will influence. If we have Democrats in control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, you will see a major increase in taxes. You will see an effort to try and come up with a public option, which will expand the one thing. Do you know what drives most states deep into the red? Do you, do you know what the single biggest budget item is that, that pushes states into debt and then causes more borrowing, and then there's interest payments, which means, guess what? More tax on all of you. It is Medicaid. It is the government's idea of providing health care for people at a certain income level. That's the single biggest driver of state debt. Do you think that a public option is going to be a plan that people will want to be on? The only way that happens is if they're getting a much better deal. They're getting much more out of it than they pay into it. And that's going to drive up the cost of health care for everyone else because you're going to be subsidizing that public option, just like your taxes currently pay for Medicaid. So that's one thing. They'll definitely do that. I mean, that's a given. There'll be environmental policies. There'll be an increase in the corporate tax rate to whatever it will be, 28% or 30% or who knows, which means that you'll see a decline in the stock market. You'll see a decline in your 401ks. Hiring will go down just at a point when we could see a major economic recovery. And we can tell based on what's already happened this year under Trump That there is a lot of cash on the sidelines or a lot of people just waiting, just waiting for that green light for the economy to open back up again post-COVID. 
and there'll be a flurry, a frenzy of productive wealth creation for Americans all across the country. That can happen, but if you have these Democrats able to do whatever they want without Republicans having a majority in any uh, in any aspect of the rulemaking and implementing part of the government, right? If, if they have the White House and the Congress all locked up, they're going to do whatever they want. So those are things that will absolutely happen. And then we get into the what could happen. Then we get into the what if things get really bad. And for that, I would just bring you to the long-term structural changes that Democrats can go for right away. They are already talking about, and they're still doing it, going right into an election here. They're talking about statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico, which would add four United States senators, which means they're going to have a Senate majority for the next, let's say, decade or two. And that's really just baked into the cake. That's all done if they do that. Uh, They're going to try to pack the courts. They will. I shouldn't say try. They will pack the courts with activists. They'll pack the courts with people who think that you should say amen and a women. You know it. They'll pack the courts with social justice warriors, with those who are so brainwashed by wokeness and political correctness that the law will not matter because they see a greater justice in diversity and inclusion efforts than anything actually written in statute or the Constitution. They'll, they'll have judges that reject science while claiming to embrace it on issues of the right to life in the womb. They'll, they'll put judges forward that will make sure that your liberty is, is only at the whim of the state. There's no freedom, there's no protection that you have when some Democrat demagogue comes along and says, oh, but this is really important. Oh, but COVID means that the Constitution no longer counts. The left is all on board with an ideology of the eradication of your rights when they think it's convenient, when they think it's necessary. There is no right that you have that the state cannot violate, including just the right to a fair trial, the right to not be detained for no reason. The most basic kinds of justice are under assault in the COVID era. You have things like the bill in New York State, well, they'll be able to detain you because you're considered a public health risk. Who determines whether you're a public health risk? The people in charge. How do you even get to fight that? You don't. They can just take you now. Whatever happened to habeas corpus? Whatever happened to due process? Democrats are abandoning all this, but we're not paying attention to that as a country, are we? No, no, we're supposed to focus on Trump's phone call in Georgia. Oh my gosh, impeach him again. Impeach him for what exactly? The president believes that the election was stolen from him. He thinks that Raffensperger is an incompetent buffoon, and he is. So he doesn't trust Raffensperger's word when he says, oh, no, you have the wrong numbers. And once again, they're telling us the president, because of what he said on a phone call, should be impeached and I suppose removed because it's never enough for them. It wouldn't be enough even if Trump were removed from office at this very late stage and then prosecuted. They would still feel like Trump got off easy. And this is what we are up against with these Democrats. And it's why I want to tell you, in the same way that Trump turned around the idea of fake news on the lib media, one of the great things about Trumpism has been his willingness, his ability, his tenacity in fighting back against the fake news media. He turned the term around on them and they absolutely hated it. Because remember, in the early days, they were saying that fake news was the only reason people wanted to vote for Donald Trump. It's because Trump voters were such uh, such easily fooled imbeciles that they could see things on the Internet that weren't true and say, yeah, I'm going to vote for Trump. That was what fake news was supposed to be. Then Trump said, no, you, the mainstream media, you are the fake news. You lie. You lie about things and pretend that you are the truth tellers. Makes it even worse. And they hated that. They hated it because he turned it around. Well, I say that we borrow from them once again. It is time for the hashtag resistance. And this will drive them mad. Remember this in the beginning, the very earliest days of the Trump presidency. They said that they were going to resist. And there were explicit comparisons between the French, the resistance, 
fighting against occupied Nazi uh, rule. Now, that was what they were trying. They're trying to create this uh, comparison between them and the fighters of fascism. Well, this time around, when we know who the true fascist impulse comes from, where we know who the real authoritarians are, it's the Democrat Party and the left, I say we take a page from their playbook. We resist at every stage. The Senate would give us a very powerful tool in that process, but also Trump-appointed judges should hold to the law because by doing that, they'll be sufficiently problematic for the authoritarian left. And so, therefore, that will become another avenue of resistance. We resist, and this Georgia Senate battle today is an important piece in all of that. If we have a Senate majority, we're able to stifle, stymie, hobble the agenda of Biden-Harris and the left-wing libs. We can effectively make them inept, more so than they would already be. That's what's at stake today. I certainly hope that anybody listening to this in Georgia, and I know there are many of you, I certainly hope that people listening to this who are legally able to and still can vote, and we're expecting massive turnout today from Republicans. Early voting tends to go the Democrats' way, but this time around I'm hoping Republicans show just what turnout on Election Day really means. The stakes are indeed very high. They're high for you. The Georgia Senate seats in play right now will determine how much money you have in your bank account at some level a year from now. It will determine what kind of health care options you have, what kind of environmental regulations you live under, and perhaps whether or not you can even have the option of voting for a Republican Party that has a realistic shot of taking back power at the national level. Those are the kind of things that are on the ballot, as they say. The radicalism of the left needs to be defeated. And at a minimum, at a minimum, we need to have tools like a Senate majority and an emboldened Republican base that's willing to continue this fight no matter what happens in the Trump re-election recount battle. Those are the stakes, friends. That's what we're up to today. We'll continue to look very closely at all aspects of this fight. Tomorrow, each of you is going to vote in one of the most important runoff elections of the history of our country. Frankly, forget about runoff. One of the most important elections, really. It's really not runoff. It's elections because... Uh, It's a biggie. Our country is depending on you. The whole world is watching the people of Georgia tomorrow. And you got to swamp them because everything's so crooked around. I mean, not and not here. They were saying, oh, he's complaining about Georgia. No, no, I'm complaining about eight different states. Uh, And I think we're going to win them all. Says he's going to win them all. But let's focus on what he's saying first here about the Senate race. It is absolutely critical for the reasons we're outlining it. And, and with Ossoff and, and Warnock, you do have quite a, uh, quite a duo of Democrats who are really representative of the ideological trajectory of, of that party right now. I mean, Ossoff, I mean, this is a guy who, what is, well, why should John Ossoff be a United States senator? What exactly has he done? He's done a little bit of uh, staff work for somebody else in the House, and uh, he's rich because of who dad is. Well, that's not particularly impressive, but the left loves this guy. So that tells you a lot, doesn't it? And then you have Mr. R- Mr. Raphael Warnock, uh, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, who is a doctrinaire leftist, uh, who says what he needs to say in order to appeal to his favored constituencies. And what would he do? Well, They'll do whatever the Democrat left wants them to. It's not even really clear in any way what they uh, would push for on their own. They're going to be functionaries uh, largely if they win in the Democrat machine. But that's all they have to be. They just have to go along with it. And there's the Republican candidates in this case who are, let's just be honest, not particularly strong. They're good enough. They're far better than these Democrats. And good heavens, please don't let me 
giving you a little bit of honesty here, dissuade any of you in Georgia from going out there and casting your vote for these two candidates. But Leffler uh, has done okay. And Purdue is also uh, okay. <laughs> you know, you, you really look at them and say, okay, well, but they're Republicans and they will at least support policies that will be better off for the rest of us, whether Democrats realize it or not. But Trump is clearly upset as well at what's going on in the state of Georgia. And this is a big problem. Uh, this is Georgia, friends. This is not some place that we thought we'd be having these kinds of troubles. So Democrats, there, there's the immediate power issue here of control of the Senate and also Trump continuing to contest the, uh, the outcome in Georgia. But then there's the what does this place look like? What does the state of Georgia look like in two years? What does it look like in four years? This is a, in the center of the South, trending blue state. And we have to look at why that is and what's going on. And you have to think that the GOP state apparatus is not doing a particularly impressive job at all. And Governor Kemp in particular, who just barely beat Stacey Abrams. Remember Stacey Abrams, the fake governor of Georgia? Uh, just Kemp barely beat her. Uh, Trump is unhappy with Kemp to the point where he's already threatening to campaign against him. Play 15. I'll be here in about a year and a half campaigning against you, Governor, I guarantee you that. I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't say this because I just don't want you to tell anybody outside of this room other than the millions of people. No, but, you know, I endorsed him. He was in last place. And I endorsed him. He went to first place very, like, immediately. And then he won the primary. And then I gave him a couple of rallies, which I don't like doing for other people. I was telling Kevin, I don't do rallies for other people. I do them for me, right? The president has had the incredible ability to pass his support to other people. You know, Obama, as popular as he was among Democrats, his popularity did not translate to others. When Trump shows up and says, this is my guy or gal, it tends to really move the needle in, in impressive ways. And that may continue on. We'll see. Um, we'll have to look and, and watch for what the president's next moves will be. He, he very clearly has no interest in uh, going quietly into the night. We know that much. And he's saying that he's continuing to contest this election. But right now, we got to spend the next, uh, the next, you know, Let's see. Twelve hours, friends. All that really matters. All that really matters uh, for the for the rest of of today going into tonight. Uh, we'll just say the rest of today. Forget about the 12 hours uh, th is that we get this Georgia election done and we get these two Senate seats. Everybody out there, Team Buck, Georgia, go vote. Tell your friends to vote. Stay in line. Once you're in line, it's all on you, my friends. Godspeed. What has gone wrong with the rollout of the vaccine that we've seen phone lines jammed, websites crashed? There's a lot of demand. I mean, I think at the I, end of the I, day, we, excuse finish, me, excuse could, me. If I could finish my question. You just said what has gone wrong, so I'm answering the question. If I could complete the question, though. So are you going to give a speech or are you going to answer, ask a question? With all due respect, Governor, you I'm asked trying, a question, I'm, I'm going to answer it. I'm trying to finish my you're question. Not, no, you're, you're, you're giving a speech. You asked the question. I am trying to ask you the... You're going to ask how many questions? You get three? They only got one question. Why do you get three? With all due respect, Governor, I'm just asking if I could finish my question. You didn't. You my, finished the question. I did not. My full question is what went wrong with the rollout of the vaccine when we've seen phone lines jammed, websites crashing. So you're crashing, repeating your question. To complete it for you, Governor, we've seen websites crash and also senior citizens waiting overnight for the vaccine. Where was that at? We've seen it in Duval, Broward, Orange, and Lee County. And why was, like, in Lee, why did that happen? Did you investigate that's, why? That's my question to you, Governor. You're the governor of the state. I'm not the governor of the state. Okay, but you didn't investigate why that happened. Like, in Lee County, why, why was there a big line? Did you, did you investigate why? 
Could you tell us because why? Because we, we distributed vaccine to hospitals, and, and the hospital said, first come, first serve. If you show up, we'll do it. So they didn't use a registration system. There wasn't anything that was done, and there's a lot of demand for it. So people are going to want to so go ahead and, uh, no and get it. there was no plan then from the state to make sure that senior citizens didn't wait outside overnight? So the state is not dictating to hospitals how, we're not dictating to Carlos Magoya how he runs his operations here. That would be a total disaster. These guys are much more competent to be able to deliver health care services than a state government could ever be. Knockout from Ron DeSantis against a, a, a CNN fake news journo. I've never seen that one before, but there she was. I, 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 like, I like this. Republicans have to do this. When you're up against a 95% Democrat media, when you're up against a, a, news, uh, a news apparatus that will do everything in its power to help one side and to crush you, to attack you all the time, you've got to take every opportunity to point out the bias because otherwise they get what they want and they win. So you've got to say, hold on a second, why, why is the premise of your question based in the failures of the state and you want to do some long rambling speech. Look, she wanted her MSNBC moment. Well, she got her Fox News moment, perhaps. She wanted to be able to attack Ron DeSantis, who has been the best governor of a large, populous state in the country at handling COVID. All right, people vote with their feet. The numbers don't lie. When you see the top places where Americans are moving, and this is from, there's a U-Haul in the big moving company. They put out their data. Uh, there's, there's other moving companies that have done the same. Where is everybody going right now? All right, we've been in a crisis. States are doing different things. And this is the way it's supposed to be, right? States are able to pursue their own pathways to deal with a crisis like this. And where, where are people fleeing and where are people showing up? Well, they're leaving in unprecedented numbers, at least in modern history. You know, New York, California, New Jersey. They're leaving big blue enclaves, right? The heart of the Democrat uh, financial you know, money and political power infrastructure. They're saying, this is just crazy. Where are they going? Florida, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina. Either somewhat red or very red states, but also states that have low or no income tax, states that have been more open during the COVID pandemic. Ron DeSantis has been basically running one big move here, it's better ad during all of this. And to, uh, to our, our listeners um, in, in the Miami area and, and in the Tampa area, we got uh, WFLA and WIO, uh, WIO, uh, WOI, sorry, WIOD. Uh, to our listeners down in the Florida area, we, we would just say congratulations for uh, already being down there. <laughs> right? Good job. Uh, good job. So I've just got to tell you, I'm, I'm um, amazed that the broader perception hasn't shifted faster here. Uh, you see everyone's going to places that are doing a better job with this. and They're fleeing the places that the media pretends. Gavin Newsom and Governor, and, and Governor Cuomo Governors Newsom and Cuomo are a disaster, an absolute disaster. And all the data shows it. You got 22,000 dead in, uh, in Florida from COVID with 2 million more in population. You've got over 30,000, and now I think it's like 33 or 34,000 dead in New York. That's a lot more. That's a much bigger death toll. And, and Florida has an even higher percentage of seniors. Remember, the, the biggest vulnerability group is senior citizens you'd think that florida would have been hit worse than anybody by this but no and in terms of uh uh, in terms of deaths per capita they're essentially in the middle of the pack but understand this they're in the middle of the pack for a for a state that has a lot of uh pretty dense cities and also for a state that hasn't been closed down the closed down state should be they, they should be able to point the lockdown states should be able to point at more open states and say, oh, my gosh, look at what a terrible job you've done. Look at how much better off we are. Not going to do that in California right now. California is having its worst ever period 
of COVID cases. Los Angeles hospitals, according to the Daily Mail, have suffered a 1,000% spike in admissions because of COVID, and ambulances have been told to stop transporting patients with little chance of survival. Now, Los Angeles was held up as a model for all of us, and I, I think we, we need to remember this. Los Angeles and California, they were, see, we wear masks, unlike you dumb Trump supporters, which isn't even true. People all across the country wearing masks. But they had this belief that the only people that don't wear masks are Trump supporters, and therefore, they were really, uh, they were really horrible about this, too. You know, it, it, was, our, it was our fault when, any, when anyone on the right got sick. It was, it was our problem that we had created. Well, what's the situation in Los Angeles? Why, why is COVID so out of control there? It has a relatively moderate climate. I mean, can, it's not quite Florida, but pretty close to it. Why is it so much worse off? The people that told you they knew what to do and their policies would work were wrong. They were wrong. They can deny this as much as they want. They can pretend it's not true. They were wrong. Didn't work. They can say it's because we didn't do a good enough job. They can have all the excuses they want. But at the end of the day, you know, if this if this is a war, their battle plan did not succeed. All right. The generals need to get fired. That's what's happening in California. Meanwhile, in, in Florida, yes, it's not perfect. Obviously, there are a lot of people who are getting sick and, and, a, and a lot of people who are dying in Florida from COVID, but that's happening everywhere. But Florida is still open. And Ron DeSantis isn't going to sit there and have a CNN reporter do a speech in the, you know, do a speech under the guise of a question to basically be why you're doing such a bad job with the vaccine rollout. Have you seen such an aggressive question posed by any CNN journalist? to Governor Cuomo ever, particularly about his disastrous COVID response? No, of course not, because this is all important to the overall narrative. There, there's a broad narrative here of who is better at handling this public health challenge, the same way that we would have this on issues of national security. Do you trust Democrats or Republicans more on national security? For a long time, it was a huge, clear favorite of Republicans, and then it balanced out a little bit after some of the Mideast wars and uh, but I think it would still be, I'd have to check the most recent polls, Republicans tend to have an advantage there. Well, on who do you trust to do a better job in a pandemic? They've blamed Trump for all this, but really you have to look at this on a state-by-state -state level. And Republican states are doing better in their fight against COVID than Democrat, than large Democrat states are. And now I know one of the highest uh, deaths per capita states, for example, is Massachusetts, where you have a technically Republican governor, but it's a Democrat state overwhelmingly Democrat voters and the Dem and the politicians that have power there are, you know, and it's this guy is not like some Trump supporting Republican either. He's kind of a, a fakey Republican, you know. But you look at the places that have had the worst, worst results, New York, Michigan, New Jersey, Massachusetts, now California. Really bad results from this. And the media can't allow this to be a widespread recognition. They can't allow people to figure out, hold on a second. I thought Democrats were the science people and they wear masks. So it's all so much better. Why is it so much worse in their state? They probably argue about population density, which is it, that is a reasonable point to make, but that doesn't explain the full disparity. Look at Texas. Look at Florida. Where would you have rather been during this uh, during this pandemic? And it's states that are more red. Even with, even with large cities, even with huge populations, you'd rather be in a state that's more red. And then you also have the growth of the tyranny mindset among Democrats. Do you, do you know that in New York right now, there's, there's a bill that has been in circulation that would allow Governor Cuomo to just detain people who are believed to be a public health risk? But let me get into this, because these details, this is chilling. And if they can do it in New York, trust me, they're going to want to do it in California. There are other places they'll try this as well. And if you think the federal government under a Biden administration is going to try to step in and protect your basic constitutional rights, you're in for a surprise. <laughs>
I think one of the biggest things I learned, and I say this as a neurosurgeon, uh, you know, someone who, who operates on people uh, who are in the worst of situations often, is that, is that science cannot rescue us from ourselves. Um, we can have these incredible breakthroughs, and we will in vaccines and therapeutics and new forms of testing. I mean, it is really just remarkable to see. And I think we will be a different world as a result of the medical innovation that we have seen this year. But if we don't lean into the basic health practices, um, they make such a big difference. I mean, even now, 100 years after the, the great pandemic of 1918, the same things made the biggest difference. Wearing masks, keeping distance, washing hands. We can talk about mRNA vaccines and all those things, but washing hands and wearing a mask makes as big a difference. It doesn't sound as, as neat or as fancy, but it can make such a huge impact. And it's something I, I, will, I will now always remind my patients of. I want you to be very clear about this. Here you have the CNN's favorite on-air doctor, Dr. Gupta, telling you that washing hands and wearing masks uh, is as important as a vaccine. Does, does anybody really believe that? I know there are people who have been brainwashed, but, but, but think about that for a second. The vaccine is 95% effective. So how, how are we supposed to take this? Hand washing and mask wearing is 95% effective. Well, then explain California to me, Doc. Oh, this was all so obvious. It was so obvious that at the very beginning of this, all these so-called experts were telling us they know the history. They know about the pandemic of 1918. At the beginning, they're saying, no, nah, I don't wear masks. That's, that's how obvious this was in medicine. Right? But they're, they just doesn't matter. They just keep saying it. What are they going to do, admit that they've been wrong this whole time about really important stuff? No, they're never going to do that. So they tell you that we can't save us from ourselves. You didn't do a good enough job. That's that's the takeaway you're supposed to have. Yeah, masks and hand hand washing. Really? Show me that. Show me the hand washing as a means of stopping covid data. I'm just curious. Show me that data. Prove that one to me. Stop telling me. Prove it to me. Oh, but, you know, we did this study where people said they thought they washed more hands and because they washed more hands, maybe they thought, no, no, I want proof. Like I'm going to inject something in my arm that's going to save my life kind of proof. Not, oh, I think if you wash your hands, maybe theoretically it could help prevent some tiny percentage of spread, which when played out hundreds of millions of times over the course of a month may result in, you know, how many fewer cases? A handful? Who knows? This is what they're saying. That's right. It was all about masks. You see, the whole time, that's all we needed. Oh, wow. Okay. So somehow mask compliance goes up dramatically, 97% in a lot of these states. And yet we're having the worst outbreaks we've ever had. Worse than when nobody was wearing masks, really, or very few people. Explain that to me. Make that make sense. Oh, and they come up with all these. And, and then their explanation, you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that, that's not true. And then you say, shut up, science. That's what they do. While that's all happening, you have things like New York Bill A416. Now, I know for those of you who are listening in other states all across the country, you're probably thinking, well, this isn't my problem. Hmm. Uh, remember, I told you the stuff you're seeing in New York, the crazy lockdowns, the uh, the, the nonsense that we're all being put through in New York City, uh, that is now replicated in many other Democrat cities and states across the country. So get ready for stuff like this. New York Bill A416, it would give the governor the ability to imprison or deport anyone he says is a public health threat. <clears throat> but not only is this now, this is detaining people without, without trial. Now I know they're going to say, oh, but it's, But, you know, it's like quarantine. Yeah, Uh, taking quarantine powers for sick people, for things, you know, for if somebody has smallpox or somebody has Ebola, that's one thing. But this is quarantine powers for, well, we think there's the possibility you may be sick with COVID even though you feel fine and the tests are too sensitive, but we can still lock you up. This is from the bill. This is from the text of the bill. Quote, upon determining by clear and convincing evidence that the health of others may be endangered by a case contact or carrier or suspected case contact or carrier of a contagious disease, that in the opinion of the governor, 
may pose an imminent and significant threat to the public uh, public health, resulting in high mortality. The governor or of or his or her delegee, including local health department commissioners, may order the removal and or detention of such a person or group of person, persons by issuing a single order. That's right. The governor or any health department official or anyone else that he designates can lock you up, can detain you because they think you are a health threat. Oh, but this won't be abused, right? This won't be used to get compliance. Really? Speak out against lockdowns? Refuse to wear your mask? You got to get locked up. You're a threat to public health. Don't you see how this is playing out? Don't you see the threat to your freedom and to your liberty from this? It's not just in New York. This is the Democrat mentality nationwide. It's not a question of whether they want to do this. It's do they have the power to implement this kind of authoritarian insanity because they want to. 